good evening everyone in india and good afternoon in uk uh, it's my privilege to uh, get yet another webinar in these difficult times to uh, of our uh, this is on ethics in pediatric medical care uh, and we are privileged to have a great uh, a very great uh, uh, speaker and a very great chairperson who definitely do not need any introduction their name itself is an introduction Uh, so i would just like to introduce um, our moderator dr satyajit who is my colleague at ankura hospital uh, he is training pediatric critical care and is currently leading the ankura as ravanagar branch over to you dr satyajit <clears throat> thank you dr nikhil uh, good evening to all of you i thank ankura hospital uh, pih academic team for giving me the opportunity to moderate the session Uh, today we have an excellent topic for discussion that is ethics in PICU as you said uh, it will be presented by dr joe wildly uh, dr joe uh, he is currently working as clinical lead for organ donation in goes london and uh, other than his uh, bachelor degree from university of leeds in 1993 he has obtained uh, mrcp edinburgh in 1996 and uh, Followed by FSPCS in '98, in MA in Medical Ethics and Law from Keele University, and uh, he is a fellow of Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, during his tenure, uh, he obtained uh, many memberships and positions and posts, which is very much appreci appreciable. To name few, to name a few, uh, he was immediate and fast care person. Uh, of Royal College of College of Pediatrics and Child Health Ethics and Law Advisory Committee, and he was also past president of uh, European Society of Pediatric and uh, Neonatal Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, he was chairperson of European Board of Pedi uh, Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. I welcome Dr. Joe for today's as uh, today's speaker, and uh, uh, and I am pleased to introduce. today we have an eminent personality who is going to share your session who is none other than dr pravin khilnani sir uh, and we have all grown up seeing him as intensivist and uh, probably we are the one uh, he is the kind of inspiration for us to take the intensive care as a branch uh, i would i would say he is the father of pediatric intensive care in india and the face of pediatric intensive care in the inter, in front of international community is currently the vice chancellor of iap college council of pisu chapter 2020 and he is also the founder editor of journal of pediatric critical care into since 2014 he is currently the director of pediatric critical care senior consultant for neurology and academic director of rainbow group of hospitals india uh, i welcome sir dr pravin khilani sir Thank uh, you. For this talk, and I request you to introduce the topic, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for this kind introduction, and uh, I think uh, as we all uh, practice intensive care day in and day out, the integral thing that is attached to intensive care is the ethics, and not only have to have to. Uh, have this practice to be very ethical but for us not to burn out from the pq because it's a very labor intensive field but at the same time the ethics of this whole delivery of intensive care has to be upkept and uh, i'm so glad uh, to see joe today here agreed to talk on this topic and uh, without wasting any further time uh, we'd like to uh, hear what joe has to say about ethics in practice of pediatric critical care jo wonderful i hope you can no, hear me yes. please sir can you hear me yes sir yes you are yes we can okay yeah. so sorry guys thank you so much for the invitation and the the kind introduction praveen and colleagues and i um would start by saying extremely honored to be able to come and talk with you I had better start by saying that I work in the UK so when you think about ethics and ethical dilemmas I had better start off by saying we can only see what's happening in India at the moment and having gone through our own very difficult time with covid last year we stand together with you but I you know talking about ethics in such a time 
in terms of the children's hospital might seem a little bit different than you might expect. But um, I will focus on our ethics work over the last few years and touch on some of the COVID dilemmas we have faced. Um, so I'm, I'm an intensive care doctor, um, but I've taken on and lead uh, bioethics or ethics in the children's hospital at Great Ormond Street, which is a, uh, a children's hospital in North London, uh, which has pretty much all the specialities. And of course, I, we always put this up because we featured in the Olympic Games in London, which was uh, one of our highlights. And uh, we'll start off with that. <clears throat> so when I um, come into work, the ethical dilemmas I see and we talk about our myriad, I mean, the way paediatrics has developed over the last 20 years has transformed how we work inside healthcare and hospitals. Um, some of those are about the rights of parents versus the rights of children to make decisions, to think about complex things. And um, certainly in my country, we've had a huge um, migration and that brings an enriching diversity of culture, religion, faiths, and parents, family, and indeed our staff, our, our nurses and doctors, bring all of these things to their decision-making in difficult situations. Um, we have increasingly uh, children we might call life-limited. They suffer from diseases that will ultimately kill them, but who knows when? And the questions about what interventions are done in that time might sound a bit interesting, particularly to you guys when you're facing so many uh, very difficult situations with acute COVID. But I think this is something that will, where, where the UK has gone in the last few decades will probably show you, I mean, you're already going there having been over a couple of times to India now to talk, but the number of children who will survive on technology will increase over time. Then into this, we have vaccine refusal, populism. I'll talk more about that. Young people's decision-making for themselves without their parents necessarily having a veto over that might be worth thinking about. And then more and more, I mean, the hospital I work in is a rare disease hospital. And we do do an awful lot of innovative experimental treatments as well as being a major research center. So trying novel treatments and um, when there are no other alternatives for a child is something that's quite common. It might surprise you how often that's done. Finance is, is very important. How does the state pay for all the stuff we do? And should we think about that when we're treating children? Should we not think about that? And you might think about how we think about uh, second opinions. And then the more difficult stuff maybe to talk about, I'll come on to that towards the end, social media, populism, uh, Brexit and the BJP. Okay, no politics, I won't talk about politics, but there is a similarity about how um, I think the UK government and Indian governments have um, acted over COVID, some good, some less good. Um, and then of course, COVID itself. And I'll talk about that maybe at the very end. So, this is very UK centric or, or kind of um, Western centric, if you like, but, but this is important stuff. <clears throat> so we more and more have children whose parents might decide at the top right that they don't want treatment for a treatable brain cancer. They don't want radiotherapy. They would like to use dietary treatment or a homeopathy. And this is something that's more and more becoming a feature of complex cases. On the left, we have a family in the United States who didn't bring their child to have simple treatments such as antibiotics. When they got a severe infection, the child died. And they said, well, we wanted to pray for our child. We thought prayers might work versus seeking any kind of um, treatment for the child. And that's a really important question, a tension there between the rights of the family to be decision making over every member of that family versus the right of someone to have access to medical care that can save them and other complex dilemmas that are out there played in the public domain. Some of the more recent stuff, we have a, a judge who ruled that a six-year-old wouldn't be treated for cancer in Australia, and the parents decided they didn't want that. And actually the rest of the medical fraternity were very keen to treat that child. That's incredibly challenging for the medical teams to face. And then more recently, we have a, a complex patient you might recognize from a uh, our own patient group here, Charlie Gard, a, a worldwide controversy about that, and Donald Trump being involved with uh, getting involved with the social media aspects of that situation, Alfie Evans, and then another case in the UK. So <clears throat> just to start out at the outset to talk about how decision making is done in the UK. And so very much we are pushed by the National Health Service to talk about shared decision making. 
So the doctor shares decision making with the patient. And this is a very different scene than, say, 30 years ago, where the doctor would determine things and a very paternalistic environment would and the patient would generally comply. Here we have a situation where the clinicians bring expertise, treatment options, evidence, risks and benefits. The patient knows best about their preferences, their circumstances, their goals, their values and beliefs. And of course, for a child, substitute parent for that or the child as they get older. And this is interesting, that shared decision making is now the state paradigm. But here's a challenge for us in paediatrics. Our first rule in the UK, our General Medical Council, for those who've worked in the UK, that's the body you have to register with and they have your medical license under their control. Rule one, make the care of your patient your first concern. But here you go. Let's think about the adult intensive care situation on the left. I've just spent about 16 weeks looking after adults with COVID, which is great fun. I have no doubt the patient is the man in the bed. On the right, here is a child in our ICU and arguably is the patient the baby in the bed or is it the parents and the baby in the bed? This family-centered concept of care and certainly in pediatrics, certainly in the ICU, we spend a lot of time talking with the parents who give their permission. They provide their consent for our treatment on their child. A couple of papers there and these slides will be available for you later on couple of papers to read more about that feminist ethics and a family-centered approach to how pediatrics uh, works and actually most of the time that is a very very good way of practicing medicine for children so this is a concept that Lynn Gillam came up with the zone of parental discretion it's based on kind of some uh, European state health law if you like but the idea that there are usual practice Every day, 99.9% .9 of decisions are made where the doctors, the nurses say, we think this, the parents say, yep, yeah, or the child, if they're old enough, can say, yep, yeah, that's okay, and they consent. Outside there, outside this is this zone of parental discretion where the parents can say, yes, I want that, or no, I don't want that, are two extremes. And at one end, there are treatments that parents cannot demand. They cannot insist on you as a doctor delivering treatments at one end. And I use a silly example, but it gives you an idea of what goes on. I have little idea about the law in India, I have to say, but most people do not know this. In my country, it is illegal to to, to a child, full stop. So a child is someone under the age of 18 in England and Wales, 16 in Scotland, and it's the family, the, the, the tattooing act, I think it's called. And you cannot tattoo a child, even if it's your 16 year old daughter, for those of you with 16 year old daughters, you have my sympathy, I remember it well, but it is against the law to do this, so you can't demand it. And there are similar treatments that parents cannot demand. Plastic surgery on, um, I don't know, breast augmentation of a 14 year old, one that often gets put around as a, a ludicrous thing that some people have tried to get done. And um, the other side, there are treatments that parents cannot refuse. So emergency neurosurgery, it doesn't matter if the parents say they don't want to have any treatment, they don't consent to the operation. If a child has an expanding blood clot in the brain, an operation will happen and you can talk to the lawyers later on, but you must keep that child alive by operating. Inside these two things is normal practice where the parents can decide which of the medical treatment options they decide to go for. What's fascinating is this area is in flux. And when we do some qualitative research, so interview based research, partly with the families who've got children with complex chronic conditions, and um, they feel that the clinicians listen to them much more than they used to do. And of course, this is going away now because parents are used to this situation. But the other side to that is a quote from one of our nurses. They just feel the families tell us what to do. They demand treatments and dictate things. Now, actually, the bottom of those should always have been true. And the top one isn't the case, but it, it seems that way. The perception from nurses is, is very important. And here's one of the, the initial cases where this sort of stuff um, was first discussed. This was a child in Southampton who uh, had a brain tumor and was having the standard of medulloblastoma treatment. And the parents decided they didn't want that and took the child out of the hospital without permission. Um, and you can see the quote from the father there, very, very um, hard to see that in, in the, the press for the team there. So let's get into the, the ethics side of this. I always think we go straight to the rub here in the group of intensivists. Probably the most complex ethical thing we talk about in the ICU 
is when you might withdraw life-sustaining treatment. And I make no apology in terms of talking about this with the situation that I know, which is the United Kingdom. And I do understand that in India, the law is different, culture is different completely, but I, I will speak to you of the stuff I know. So children are not supposed to die. A quote from a very famous lady, it's from the Queen Mother, our, own, our Queen's mother. And the feeling that children are not supposed to die, there's a natural order of things. But one of the things I write in my ancient papers about the law, until 1930 and 40, child death was incredibly common in the UK. It is now incredibly rare. And it'll be different in different sections of Indian society, I'm sure. But in the UK, it is now a, a, an anachronism for children to die. But they still do. But the culture of society is it should be a very rare event. And it's held that way. In, in most countries now who have kind of modern healthcare systems, most child deaths occur in a hospital. And of those dying, more and more are happening in the ICU. So that does mean that about 70% of deaths in our ICU are in the presence of technology and often involved with holding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. And this is one of the key factors that it sits very, very um, in a difficult place in UK society. There is a feeling that death should be natural, that no one should make decisions about someone's death. But here's the point, most deaths have some medical decisions made about them all across the board from uh, the old person in a home who chooses not to come into hospital, from someone who has a DNR, a do not resuscitate in place at their own request, to stopping a ventilator. There are medical decisions about most deaths. Very, very few people die from failed resuscitation. And in our hospitals, that would be failed resuscitation with an ECMO run to die with no decision being made. Into this, our UK Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, many years ago, came up with the first document in the UK um, about this concept, how you make these decisions. And of course, I'm slightly biased because I'm one of the authors of the last iteration of this, but I think it's worthwhile reading, even if the law might be different in your country, the ethical stuff in there is, is across the board. It works across there. And this is a framework for practice. It isn't a cookbook. It doesn't tell you what to do. It's how to start the conversation, addressing the circumstances when life-sustaining treatment may not be in a child's best interests. And there's the framework on the right. It's free in archive disease of childhood, the supplement um, 2S1. You can find it under my name. Um, 2015, and we went through it last year, it's still fit for purpose. The change in more recent years, and this really is quite helpful to talk about, I think, in terms of how end of life decision making and limiting life sustaining treatment has, has changed. There is a lot more palliative care involved um, in end of life care for children, wherever they are, that includes the ICU. There's much more organ donation and that has become a routine part of all end of life considerations, uh, particularly in the ICU. The categories about when this can be thought through one is when life is limited in quantity, one is when life is limited in quality, and the other major change is a new third category where withdrawal or withholding of life sustaining treatment is uh, reasonable if a competent child consents to that approach with the support of both the clinical team and parents. One thing I've roughly glibbed over there, I'm saying withholding and withdrawing. And this is very interesting because those two things are similar in law, but very, very different in terms of your culture and how it feels. So the difference between deciding not to start invasive life-sustaining treatment to resuscitate and put someone on a ventilator or stopping life-sustaining treatment. Withholding is not starting, withdrawal is stopping it once you've started. These decisions can be hard and I'll come on to how we work through them. But my key thing is if there is disagreement or difficulty with a family, the important thing is none of us, wherever we work, wherever we are on the planet, we should not deal with this situation alone. And we shouldn't ask the family to deal with it alone either. These decisions should not be made rapidly, urgently overnight. They're normally decisions that are best thought through, talked about repeatedly with families. Of course, there may be situations when there's a resuscitation to be discussed and that needs to happen quickly. I'll come on to that a bit later on. But the key thing is that disagreement difficulty, you are not alone. And I, I think for those of you who might be trainees in intensive care or pediatric pediatricians in training, you'll be amazed how these wonderful people who you think are amazing, um, Praveen, other people, we will still talk to each other at night 
with colleagues to, to have a second opinion about things, to think through things. I think you'll be quite surprised to know how frequently that happens. And we're getting better at telling our trainees, look, when there's a tough situation, I will not deal with that on my own at three o'clock in the morning. I will call a colleague if it's very difficult, talk to friends. And in the daytime, it is much easier, of course. We think about second opinions. We call other hospitals. We get them to come and see our patients all the time. It is open, transparent, and very sensible. And it's helpful for not just the family to know that someone else thinks what you're doing is reasonable and you're not trying to hide things away. It's also helpful for you as a professional to know that your treatment is in line with the standard that other people would do. We certainly have a lot of help in terms of um, our religious people in the hospital. We're really lucky to have chaplains of all major faiths. We have a, a Muslim chaplain, we have access to a Hindu chaplain, we have our own kind of uh, uh, Church of England, Roman Catholic. We're really lucky that people we don't have in the hospital, uh, we can access like a Buddhist chaplain, humanism, whatever works for the family. We have a patient advocation liaison service, which is really good in terms of someone who can stand and help the family through the complexity of healthcare. It can be really hard for parents to even understand how hospitals work. And we're not so good at explaining that because we're so used to them, we work in them every day. And then social services here are a very big support thing. If things are carrying on, we have clinical ethics committee, I'll come on to what that is. And we actually can do go along to talk to families about the complex decisions being made. The Clinical Ethics Committee has um, uh, philosophers, judges, clinicians, ethicists, previous parents, children's authors, you name it. It's a very eclectic group, but brings great strength in reviewing cases. Um, hospital management, don't forget they're the people who are responsible for what you do, the legal team in the hospital. And then outside agencies, including our own chaplaincy, we will bring in figures who you know, might be someone who we don't know at all. Uh, my favourite has been with the um, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. I had a phone call with him one night. That was very interesting for a family who was obviously very influential. No problem at all. We're very open and transparent about how we think about these tough decisions. Finally, if things can't be resolved, we have a statutory duty to involve the courts. That is pretty unusual, but does happen. I've got a hand up. I'm not sure if you want me to deal with that now or to um, talk later on. Carry on, please. Carry on. Okay, Nicole, thanks. So axioms about decision making, this is very important. How you make decisions about complex situations in the IC or anywhere else. There must be open, timely communication and mutual respect. And that can be really challenging if people have got very angry or trust has been lost. That's really important and why you must try and keep a good relationship with families, even in the most difficult circumstances. Um, and I think this is one of the key points. There are no difficult families. There are families going through a very difficult time. And um, decisions that must be informed and freely made. Any disagreement is best resolved by consensus. Um, parents in the UK have ethical and legal authority unless they cross what's called the best interest uh, threshold. So if they want to do something that isn't in the child's best interests and harm is a very big component of that, that falls outside the, what I talked to you about before, the zone of parental discretion. Other than that, the parents are able to make decisions. The child themselves, their own wishes, current and antecedent, if they're in ICU, sedated on the ventilator, they must be given appropriate weight in accordance with the child's understanding. So a child of four who doesn't want a heart transplant, well, you know, not sure that's really going to influence things, but a child of 14 who doesn't want a heart transplant, that starts to become a very important bit of information. If disagreement carries on, we do have mediation, uh, where someone can come and try and mediate between the two parties involved, and then ethical and legal intervention if you have worsening disputes. I think at this point, it's really worth thinking about this, that we sometimes lose in the white heat of medicine and what we do. And this is an old bit of work, the Hastings Center, the think tank in the US, the goals of medicine, the prevention of disease, the relief of suffering, the care of the ill and the avoidance of a premature death. And I do think it's worth every so often going back because they're very powerful, very important things. And we lose these sometimes, I think all of us do because of all the noise and everything else going on. That is why I think everyone's probably gonna be a doctor on the, the call. That is why you became a doctor. That is why we became nurses. That's why we became healthcare professionals. That is what we go every day to work to do. 
The other thing I'll say, and I'll come on to why, I think we use some terms occasionally that are very offensive to people and futility is one that now has become very problematic. It's loaded and sometimes inaccurate in how we use it. And I'll explain that more in a moment. So here you go. Here's my favorite Muppet, Stadler and Waldorf. Musings on what happened in the last decade. As an old man, I can look back at this and say, well, we are seeing slightly more cases going to court. Our court process are taking longer. But the key thing is society has changed. Um, and this is throughout the world. If you think about Trump and Johnson, um, and, and some of the things are very good because populism at one level, and my father-in-law, who's a, an arch populist, won't mind me saying this, you should listen to people. The population is what we are there for. So populism has unpleasant connotations for some, but for others, it means those that have not got um, previously felt empowered or listened to are now being able to speak and their voices are going to be heard. Pluralism, that's an important concept. Respect for many different faiths and religions and ways of living. But the other side to this is there's a little bit of contempt for expertise that's kind of in there. Some of this has come from the press, I think. Some of it from our politicians. Uh, I think there's a famous quote from one of our politicians about the Brexit thing saying, I think we've had enough of experts. And uh, of course, that's reversed rapidly with COVID and the need for expertise like never before. But that kind of idea that we've had enough of experts is, is kind of still there in some ways. Um, certainly in our country, the print media is much more aggressive towards uh, hospitals and doctors. And the previous deference to the medical professional, yes, doctor, you're always right, was very problematic too. But I think there is a real difficulty now in terms of print media, social media. I'll come on to that towards the end. So I'll go completely to a different place now. What about money? Well, here we go. How much does your country spend on health? I'm very sorry, I don't have India on here. This is a Commonwealth United States think tank. And this is where I think it's fascinating that the UK with many health problems here comes out relatively well, um, possibly because we spend fewer uh, US dollars on health than most of these other countries. This is old now, it's about a decade old. There's a more recent version, but it's not too different. Um, and if you can look there, all the paradigm things in health that you would want, effective care, safe, coordinated, patient-centered, we do pretty well in the UK, cost-related problem, good. Time limits is a problem in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of waiting lists and other things. Efficiency, pretty good, number one. Equity, fair, pretty good, just behind the sweets. Healthy lives, we are not good. And I think this is where COVID is bitten into the UK, where we have prevalence of type 2 diabetes, obesity, lots of uh, the sorts of things that increase your mortality in COVID. Um, there are lots of discussions here about government lockdowns and timeliness, but I think one of the main problems is in terms of the, the population that COVID affects. Unhealthy people did worse with COVID. You can see the United States just below us. But generally, a healthcare system that is very efficient and actually you get a lot for your money. But here you go, here's a question to throw to you guys. Which costs more? I don't think we can go interactive on here, so you can all have to think about the answer yourself. A BMW 520D from 2014, a hip replacement, a day on Great Ormond Street specialist, amazing nurses, pediatric intensive care, or my own thing that I've been trying to persuade the wife for many years, a British Lions rugby tour of New Zealand. Um, it won't mean much to you, but I, I wonder if you've all got an answer for which one you think is most expensive. How many of you went for the hip replacement? Because that is the answer. Of course, it depends on how healthcare is funded, but because hip replacements are very commonplace, um, people don't value them. Most people I think are intensivists would have bet on the, uh, the day in the ICU. So hip replacement costs about 7,800 UK pounds, a day on our ICU is just under 4,000, as is the car. And the rugby tour was even cheaper, but my wife was didn't let me go. I was very upset. But how about this? What's the cost of the third redo must Nissan fund application, spinal fusion, and a lifetime of invasive ventilation in a child with cerebral palsy? Well, Ben Wilfond, I can't put his quote up, I'm a bit short for time, but um, he's a, a pediatrician in the US who writes brilliantly about the rights of disabled children, the value of disabled children, and more importantly, the value of people who've got complex problems to society. And how we treat those individuals is a marker of how developed our society is. 
But I will throw that there as in, I agree with both points of view, because there's almost a side that you can't ask the question of how much the cost of the things at the top actually are. How much is the outcome? And is it cost effective versus other children's opportunity costs? So I think both are important concepts. Here's another interesting thing. This is the number of intensive care beds per 100,000 people. This is before COVID. And one of the reasons there's lots of noise in the UK is we have much fewer ICU beds per 100,000 people. This is how we choose to spend our healthcare money. Per capita healthcare cost is equally important. So we spend less on health. You saw that from the previous slide. We have fewer ICU beds, fewer doctors in those other countries. Yet life expectancy, and maybe that's what we ought to be aiming for, the longer healthy life, is better in the UK than many other countries. Less good than places like Spain and Japan. But that's about the healthy living aspects of that and less about healthcare than other things. So pediatric medicine, I always put that little underline there just for my American friends because they can't spell pediatric. This is the guy I thought I would be when I was in medical school sometime in the last century. And this is a famous painting. It's in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, I think, called The Doctor. And the key thing is the doctor is sitting there looking at a child who is dying from severe sepsis. And the key thing is the author, or the, sorry, the painter, is the gentleman fading into the background. And this is the death of one of his children. So he painted this and the attentiveness and the care of the doctor by the bedside, which we can all aspire to do and, and be like this guy. But actually, what's happened is I've become more like this guy, our own famous Doctor Who, where all we do is machinery and technology. So let's come on to technology and the ICU. So for intensivists, neonatal pediatric, survival rates are massively increased over the last couple of decades. But we are doing more and more things to children. Here's a child having open chest ECMO for interest. We did very well in the end. ECMO, Berlin Hearts, multiple organ transplants, stem cell transplants, gene therapy, um, CAR T cell treatment now, and more and more long-term ventilation, for an example, for chronic lung disease, but also for neuromuscular conditions with increasing uh, dollars being spent on new treatments for things like SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, with great success for some children, less good for others. Uh, multiple palliative therapies for your disability, which improves children's quality of life massively, but has healthcare resource implications. Into the ICU, and this is probably, I think one of the most important papers I've read in my time of being an intensivist, and it shows what we do. Our own uh, UK PICANEC data agrees with this. Um, outcomes of children admitted to PICU from the Melbourne group. And you can see the data there published in 2003. Um, so 20 years, 30 years ago, about 84% alive, but 10% of those have an unfavorable outcome dependent on care. 90% favorable outcome therefore. Um, and you can see the data there and where the children died but half in ICU, another 5% in hospital, half after discharge. What changed? Well, by 2010, only seven years later, the length and stay of illness severity was unchanged, but there had been a substantial mortality reduction. So there was a seismic change in decision-making. It isn't that intensivists have got better, you'd like to think we have, but different decisions were made about continuing life-sustaining treatment, with children, and so many children with quite severe neurodisability, severe complex problems, are discharged from ICU and actually increasingly are admitted to ICU recurrently. So we have many children who have many, many ICU admissions now and occupy an awful lot of the bed days in the ICU. That has got massively important implications for patients, families, and the community as a whole, including our adult intensive care colleagues, because some of these children will now survive into adulthood and be very dependent on all aspects of daily life. Okay, let's think about death in the ICU, demographics. Well, actually, for reasons I've just said to you, death is quite rare in PICU. Mortality, actually, that was an old slide before, it's about between two and 4% in most units. But the interesting thing here is most death is medically controlled. We have a limit treatment, we have ceilings, we decide not to refer for ECMO not to do CPR, to limit the ionotropes, to not augment ventilation. 
about 40 percent we actually will withdraw life-sustaining treatment which is mo most commonly ventilation and inotropes in the ICU and ECMO of course is in there as well. About a quarter of deaths in the ICU occur in a full resuscitation situation but even then most do not go to ECMO in terms of everything will be done and about 10% are brain dead. And this idea that the idea we, we hear more and more in the press and parents often say, I want everything to be done. And that's a term that we must challenge and unpick because it doesn't make sense, but it can be very dangerous. I wonder if you thought about whether we should uh, use, use life-saving treatment in little Johnny this summer after his recent illnesses. I want everything to be done. Well, what is that? What does it mean? The other thing that's changed is end of life decision making. The decisions about withholding and withdrawal, they're different. I realize the law in terms of whether you stop ventilators in India, which is seemed when I was last over there to be really problematic and didn't really happen versus the UK where it certainly does happen or we withhold life sustaining treatment. It's different between our countries, absolutely. And because of that, some of the other end of life stuff will be different. So DBD and DCD, Organ donation, brain dead donation certainly would happen with you guys, but donation after circulatory determination of death, which occurs after elective stopping of a ventilator, will not be happening. Whether that will change over time, hard to know. The other things that ethically therefore will be different in, in India from the UK are the need to think about pre-mortem pre interventions, and that's ethically quite challenging. The idea of the things you might do to a child who is dying with consent, with sometimes the child's consent, but certainly from the parents, to increase the chance of them becoming an organ donor after they've died. And that's one of those things that 30 years ago ethically would have been extremely problematic through lots of ethics working group think tanks. We've moved on and that's probably a reasonable thing, but at what level and what interventions are you comfortable? That's a talk for another day. Again, management of the brain dead organ donor on the ICU, something that can improve the chance of organs being useful to another child or adult to something to think about and actually much less troubling than it was a few years ago. Uh, Post-mortem interventions, the other thing that's kind of really interesting and has changed. So there are many families to whom the concept of having a full post-mortem is horrific. The idea that their child has been through a lot of stuff on the ICU, you want to do what? Cut them up after they've died? No, I don't want the oil to do that. Occasionally, if it's a coroner's case, they don't have any choice. But now for people who die in the hospital where we might not have quite the diagnostic information we would have liked, um, we offer a limited post-mortem. And Neil Sabir is one of my colleagues, he's a pathologist, he's a fantastic guy. And he's done an awful lot of work with his team, improving the care of families in terms of investigations of children who have died, including doing very amazing imaging on um, uh, fetuses whose mothers have had an um, a spontaneous abortion and managing to find some diagnostic information from using on the right you can see that's an industrial CT scanner something you would never put a living patient in but the images you get are amazing. Laparoscopic biopsies done more and more so a lung biopsy of a child after death along with lots of metabolic investigations that we do very soon after the child has died so a lot more post-mortem investigations are done and for good reason. So the data, when you find it, which is quite useful, about 40% of all deaths, something major different is found in the post-mortem that was known by clinicians beforehand. And it's a real reason we should be thinking more about this. And the papers there, it's free in critical care medicine. And that's a really good issue of critical care medicine for you, PCCM rather, the August 18 issue, which was a supplement on end of life management. And it's got lots of stuff in there that's very useful. So what's changed? to think more about the ICU. Well, here we go. Prematurity has transformed uh, the mortality of babies born prematurity. Sorry, neonatal care has transformed that. Epicure data is really clear. Survival has increased at every gestation, but the proportion of babies with complex problems, problems with their brain, their lungs, their gut, NEC, has not changed. So as the survival rate goes up, so does the total number of children with very complex complications of being born prematurely. The same with congenital heart disease, an amazing success in medicine. But there you go. Here's the story of people who survived single ventricle and all the health care problems they get as they move into adulthood. And even after a good tetralogy repair in childhood, there is a sudden risk of death, particularly during pregnancy. 
Lorna Fraser in York University has done this really nice bit of work which she carries on doing, looking at children with life-limited conditions in the UK, and they're in England, sorry, they're moving up, they're increasing across pediatrics in all the diagnostic areas, metabolic, oncological, neurological. And the other thing that's really important for us on the right, they do not come across the population in, in a kind of a normal distribution. They're far more, far more likely to be in um, families who are from a different ethnic background in terms of um, Southeast Asian, very commonly for us. Um, people who might not have English as a first language, that's very important for us as well. And they certainly come from a population who have less financial resources than others. So lots of reasons behind that. But the important thing is our, our healthcare systems in the UK have not developed in a way that those people can access easily. And we've got to work much harder with that going forward. So you go, technology dependent children on every street. And more and more children are surviving with complex interventions, but with chronic organ failure. And this is important for the intensivists because when people who are living at home on life sustaining treatment get sick, where do they come? Well, it's very hard to go to the general pediatric ward when you're on a ventilator, or even you can see on a VAD, we've sent children home on ventricular assist devices. Any problems with that, you're going back to the cardiac ICU, home renal replacement, LTV, NIV. But here's a, a little pitch I do to make people think about the social determinants of health, which we don't think about nearly enough. Last year, we had a child referred for palliative home long-term ventilation, parental nutrition, but they had no home at all. And that's something you can tell me about because that must be something that's really very, very, very challenging for you guys looking after children in, in your environment. So here's our number of long-term ventilation. This has been proven by actual data. This was a, an estimate of uh, the number of children with life-limited condition. But the challenges in the UK, in one small country compared to your country, there was no equity, no process, no system of decision making. So we've come up with a long term ventilation ethical pathway, which I could talk later on. <sighs> enough, enough. It's changed hugely for us. Before we even think about the complexes of social media, it's worth just throwing vaccine refusal in for you. And on the left, you can see places like New York City have tried mandatory measles vaccination without much success. On the right, you can see the measles cases per million reported. This is a disease that was almost removed from Europe. And in my country, you can see we're starting to have measles. In Italy, there are children dying of measles every year because of vaccine refusal, because of a poverty of herd immunity. And that's the problem. The people who die of measles are often those who've not refused to vaccinate. They're people who either are unwell from other conditions or they're too young to have vaccines. It's a real challenge. So this idea that vaccines are bad and people refusing to have them is a real worry. What about children who are slightly older? I'll fly through this because there's not much informed consent going on in the, uh, the pediatric ICU. There is a little as we have more children who are more awake actually. So the key thing for us is I'll fly through that, but basically children are allowed to consent to treatment through age of, over the age of 16 and they can prove themselves able to consent below 16 but they can't really refuse a complex decision in law until they're 18. Although occasionally, you know, you won't force a 17 year old to have a heart lung transplant, that's for sure. Okay, what about trying stuff to go completely different place to finish off with? Because it's not just all about end of life stuff. We actually think about trying new treatments. What's the best way to try a treatment that might help? Well, a research study, if we have research available, we should try to get the children enrolled into research studies if they're eligible. If not, well, innovative therapy, compassionate use of drugs versus allowing a child to die without further harm or distress. So this is where chemotherapy came from. Sidney Farber invented chemotherapy based on his experiences in the, uh, the war with seeing must gas do horrible things to people's white cell count. And he thought, why don't we try some of this treatment in all the children who come in with very raised white counts and die and he induced the first remissions in leukemia uh, in the US and nearly got fired for it. If you want to read more about this, Siddhartha Mukherjee's book is superb, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer. I, I commend you all to go and buy a copy and uh, make him rich but also read it because it's a superb work. Here's one of my heroes in medicine, Theodore Roosevelt. Optimism is a good characteristic but if carried to an excess it becomes foolishness. Just Think about what he said there. 
It's great to be optimistic, but if you carry it to an excess, it's stupid. Here's two other people opposing views. So Plutarch says the commission of evil, doing something evil, is no less, no more reprehensible than the omission of good. And he's saying that if you don't try and help, it's as bad as if you try and hurt. Try something. Plutarch is saying, give it a go. Try some treatments. What can go wrong? Well, Silverman will tell you what went wrong. And he wrote a wonderful book, Where's the Evidence Debates in Modern Medicine. And I don't know if any of you are neonatologists, but he really wasn't too happy about the first use of ventilators in very small babies. Or why is it they were allowed to just be put on ventilators and many suffered terribly as they died? Why was that okay? We have developed a pathway when we think about this together with children and their families from 2009, thinking about the ethical considerations for compassionate use of experimental treatment. This is when you're thinking about giving a treatment that you have not got good data to say this will work, but you think it might. How do you do it in a reasonable way? Well, you have an independent look at this and we use our ethics committees to do this. Clinical need, reasonable scientific basis, expectation it will help, consensus in the team, the parents and all the child are competent, they understand exactly what's going on and the alternatives. No coercion, resources used must justify the treatment and you must report the results, whatever the outcome. So flying through using this approach, no decision about me without me, we do these meetings with the child and the families. And we've published that. So again, these slides will be for you later, but that approach, we've used the first CAR T cells in the world in a child who actually did amazingly well, quite surprisingly, but that approach, trying them when they hadn't been using anyone before. Uh, we do different things that are really novel, uh, some with good success, some with less good success. The key thing is you report what happens so others can learn about them. Our clinicians feedback, they felt that really valuable, a chance to reflect, to think about uh, the complex ethical issues around really difficult treatment. That's good, isn't it? Doctors are happy, nurses are happy. What about the parents? Well, this is the kind of area where parents, the alternative is often end of life care. And so there's Layla who got the first gene edited CAR T cells for her leukemia and did well. Um, here's a child who got phage therapy, uh, one of our first people who got that after a lung transplant many years ago. Um, what about this stuff? Is it ever futile? Well, I mentioned before I come back to that term, that's what we should be doing. Futility, it's a loaded term. And the very uh, important bodies below, ATS, AAC, NACCP, ESICM and SECM, all our major intensive care bodies, have a statement about this and really say, don't use futile. It's so inflammatory. We should implement strategies to avoid conflict, but use potentially inappropriate, not futile. And here's the point. It might be futile to you, but if the parents want to keep their child alive for a few more days, then doing whatever they want to do might achieve that aim. So in itself, it might not be futile. So explain and advocate the plan sort out conflicts, refer to other institutions. You don't need to give something that you think is completely wrong if there's an acute reason you have to make the decision quickly, but show your working out. Get oversight from your hospital and your legal team. That's important. Futile should be reserved for things that cannot achieve the physiological goal. A head transplant is the obvious example. It can't work, okay? But we do need to think about this, and the same for you guys. We've got to do much better with public engagement to advance policies and interaction. When we cheat patients, well, when we let patients avoid death, we sometimes cheat them. Okay. There are some bills about this, this right to try act in the US and the Saatchi bill here, but I'm not sure they're particularly helpful. And um, that kind of interaction with society we have done in terms of our country, in terms of um, publications and interaction, public uh, symposia, Organ the Nation was particularly the, the one we used to, to kind of really start that discussion where it went well. Um, there are some times this gets very challenging though. So to really finish off, we do have some interesting religious campaigners in our country, uh, often from the United States coming over with a, a challenging uh, use in the press of um, 
kind of faith-based reasons why uh, intensive care must be carried on. And that's difficult because, you know, you, you can see why people would have that view. The challenge is having people have that view with knowledge and being involved with the situation. So I think it's very, very interesting when that kind of problem uh, becomes public, a uh, public domain issue, and people will come with very strong views both sides. Gwandi's line, I think, is quite good about death is the enemy. It's there for you to read later on. You don't want somebody who fights to the bitter end. You want to think about the optimized uh, treatment of the patient. Okay, bioethics, social media, a really different world. So I think one of the things we've experienced, I think uh, you may have come across some of this, uh, there's certainly a global reach in terms of decision making and complex things that get into society. I have got an awful lot of sympathy for most politicians because they are absolutely in a difficult place in terms of social media and all the difficult stuff that's out there. Anyone in the public area is in a really challenging situation in terms of having tweets, having information out there with no information to say who's putting stuff out there. And I think that's that's interesting if you're a politician and you've decided to go into that world. But if you're a nurse working in a, a hospital somewhere, I could be anywhere really, and someone's having a, a really difficult time and decides to attack you on social media, that's really difficult. And that's happening more and more, uh, both in the US, the UK, other countries. And I think it's really difficult for how hospitals manage that. I think it's a really difficult thing. So I do hope there may be some better ways through with that. But there are difficult things I've had, not, not in our hospital, but in other places where there's bedside violence, there's filming covertly by hospital beds, a really difficult situation. And it's, it's a real, real big challenge for us all. And I'll put it something here. I won't go through that, actually, because I think I'm over my time, actually. So let's leave that. So I'll finish with uh, my favourite philosopher, Immanuel Kant. Uh, doing things to versus for the child is illegal. We must be trying to operate within the child's best interests. Never treat a human being as, and there's a word missing that should be only a means to an end, even if the end is parental preference. So your aim is to do the right thing for the child. And I think I'll leave that there. Cool. I'll remind you by saying I'm doing this talk about children's hospitals and how things normally are. I'm certainly aware that both our countries have had this horrendous um, problem with COVID. And you can see, and I would argue my country's done worse than India. We have far more deaths per million population, probably because our population is much smaller. But for other reasons I talked about earlier on in terms of having a, um, an unhealthy population, but I think we are very much with you in terms of the difficulties and challenges you face. Um, oxygen provision were issues in UK hospitals. And I think amazing work is being done in India as it was done in the UK. So thoughts to everyone trying to do their best about that. So here's my current ethical dilemmas in PICU crossed out um, because COVID has almost taken over everything and maybe everything will be seen through that prism for some time. We did a bit of work, bit of work at, two years ago about planning for the next pandemic, which was interesting because it was not the pandemic we'd been planning for. And that's one thing that's affected our governments as well. We had lots of plans about flu, how that would affect children. Luckily, luck, fortune, whatever it is, COVID has not affected children as badly as it's affected adults. But the next time a terrible pandemic occurs, that might be different. And I realize in terms of you having a much bigger pediatric population than ours, perhaps you've seen more effects than we have. I think the Indian perspective, the ethical issues from talking to colleagues there some time ago are not changed for COVID actually. Social services, state welfare are big things. The sheer population size is massive. Social views of complex child illness and then provision of highly expensive treatments over many people requiring oxygen and ventilators is a big thing. So our issues in COVID were about PPE. I'm sure yours were the same. Vaccination, who should have it first? What happens in rare diseases? Should we stop the treatments we do? Well, we carried on. We brought children from New Zealand and Spain during lockdown for um, our rare gene therapy and thymus transplants, which we're pretty much the only people in the world, apart from one centre in the US that do. And there's, a, there's an interesting contract there to the world to deliver such treatments. Visiting, how do you manage only having one parent in the middle of COVID? And some hospitals in the UK had no parents, even on PICU. And that's interesting, protecting staff, which is very, very important with an unknown risk of a pandemic affecting you. And how do you make sure you don't bring infections into your hospital? Uh, the semi-elective work we've canceled has been massive. 
with huge numbers of backlog children waiting for operations and innovative expensive treatment is weird doing that when you're talking about people dying from lack of ventilators that's something that we face probably for the first time i suspect you face that on a daily basis in some ways and then we went off and looked after adults, which was interesting. I don't know about our competencies to do so. I think we did a reasonable job, but the GMC wouldn't normally supply that, uh, support that rather. Um, okay, so that's our ethics committee, by the way, just to flow that in. We have a multidisciplinary committee with all those people I mentioned there. Uh, we see about, is that 40 last year, rapid responses to go and talk with children and families. We do education and training, staff drop-ins to combat moral distress. That's a very big thing um, and research and ethics. If you're interested, there's a website for you to look at, www.chelsig.com. It's 25 pounds a year to join. Although after um, Mr. Modi's recent deal with Boris Johnson, I'm sure that'll probably be free for you guys. Um, we shall see. And here you go, I'm gonna leave you with this little thing about vaccination. This is uh, for the anti-vaxxers amongst you. Everyone who received the first smallpox vaccine in 1798 has died, it makes you think. But I'll finish with a picture you'll enjoy much more. Thank you very much, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joe. I got good bumps uh, because of your honesty of presentation. So much honesty is there. Other than, other than your, your presentations are really excellent. All the slides are really very good. And I thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to request uh, uh, Pravin Khilani, sir, to add something, sir. Sure. Uh, that was a great presentation, Joe. Uh, yes, and uh, you know, uh, you acknowledge in the middle of the talk, there are certain, you know, cultural differences and uh, the differences in the, uh, the way law works. Like if you put ventilator on somebody, very, very difficult to withdraw, uh, you know. So we, we tend to uh, follow withhold much, much more than withdraw because uh, withhold, is something that can still come under the purview of the medical judgment. Uh, and then if you decided to withhold and, uh, you know, not escalate inotropes or not put somebody on the ventilator, you know, uh, there, I think it's a little bit easier. But ours, uh, based on the resources, uh, based on the public beliefs, uh, I think ethics is much, much simpler. I'm a patient. I have come to you. You as a doctor decide what needs to be done. But if you show me the monitor showing heart rate, I don't understand it being death, you know, like brainstem death or those kinds of com complex things. So I think a lot of it in, uh, in our ICUs, what we train our, you know, trainees, well, how we talk to parents is communication on a daily basis. And I think communication solves lots of problems, lots of these problems, because once we explain it to them that you are critical, let's say, and you say, doc, what are my chances? I said, okay, uh, maybe 5%, but we will do everything that needs to be done. And in that we get stuck Sometimes when you're already ventilating, you're on high anotropes and you know that now things are not looking like, looking like any further treatment is going to be futile. Then again, communication, bringing the family together, letting the whole team discuss amongst ourselves. We do the medical opinion and then we sit with them. So that's how we have been able to successfully deal with end of life care. Now, the problem that comes up is uh, legally a brain dead patient cannot be taken off ventilator because the law doesn't allow it unless you go over that 1994 transplant act that the patient is a transplant candidate, okay, uh, a transplant donor. So I think that, that those are the differences that we see, but rest of all of your talk, there is nothing UK, US about it. It applies fully to uh, you know any of these countries, and we do get limited by resources, yes, yeah. and population. 
And I think we have to act accordingly uh, to the best of our uh, abilities. But thank you very much for giving a great talk. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it touched many aspects of not only end of life, but, you know, how you deliver uh, the care and how, how the kids are, you know, um, if, if any death has to occur, it was most likely going to occur in ICU and less and less number of deaths and more and more of uh, successful PQ outcomes, but with long-term care, you know, home ventilation, disability, and uh, that kind of thing. So I leave it open for Dr. Satyajit and uh, Nikhil to take up questions and, you know. Uh, Dr. Nikhil, we can take the questions now. Only it's one question is the chat box. Right with the questions. Yeah. Joe, shall I? I mean, I guess, Praveen, something you said there, and I think Dr. Hassan has asked a really good question. He's from Dhaka, Bangladesh. And he says, situation is very different in his part of the world. Critical care is available mostly in private hospitals where governments spend nothing. Patients, family has to pay the cost of care. At the same time, health insurance is not yet popular. Do you think health insurance could be possible to get rid of the problem? How to popularize health insurance? Well, I think that's a really important concept and one that I think is a big difference between India and the UK. Um, all our patients get free healthcare at the point of demand. Now, the good side for that is it's very fair, very equitable. Everybody is covered. As a doctor, I don't need to look at someone's um, health insurance status. The National Health Service covers everything. The other side is there is a sense of entitlement that comes with that. So speaking mm -hmm. to my colleagues in India, occasionally it's the family wanting to stop things because they absolutely can't afford the massive bill they're going to get. That's right. And so right. I think there's a big difference there. But it's not an entirely good thing, but generally it's a good thing in terms of, um, and, and our, our way of working, Neural, is um, we pay a tax. So there's a, um, basically everyone who works in the UK, as well as paying tax the government to um, have an army, have lights in the streets and police, we have a particular health tax, if you like, mm -hmm. um, which is taken out to everyone who pays. So we all pay for healthcare that way. And I think it's a government that has to decide to do that, but it's a very, very good thing. So my point is, I think it should be a health insurance system, but we have a national health insurance system. And many people choose to have something on top of that as well. You have other systems in like Germany where it's all health insurance. The only way mm -hmm. you do it is you all have to pay health insurance as it's taxed at demand. So I just wonder what, I mean, for Neural, who's asked that, is it Neural? Yeah, who's asked that question. I wonder what your thoughts are about maybe the difference between uh, India and Bangladesh that way. Uh, in terms of in India, yes, there are state institutions, which uh, the healthcare is just like an NIH system uh, in, uh, in the UK. But uh, that percentage is only about, uh, let's say, maybe around 40 to 50%. And 50% is just like Dhaka, where either the patient is paying from the pocket, but the health insurance system is widespread. You know, there are various plans available and many of the people are insured. Uh, so uh, it's, it's sort of a mix of uh, state system as well as the private system. Uh, but I think uh, it would be good idea if in Dhaka they can have more health insurance and maybe the government should pitch in to uh, fund some state institutions where at least a person who cannot afford should be able to get the health care because they do have public taxes. Everybody, uh, you know, uh, contributes taxes, but there's no separate health tax. Uh, but uh, the tax, uh, you know, in general sort of goes towards various things. And uh, this is unfortunate that doctors do not spend anything on health care. Okay. Dr. <clears throat> Nikhil, I think there are no questions left. Uh, you can yeah. conclude? Yeah, sure. Uh, can I ask? Uh, yes. Yeah, Nikhil, please. Uh, uh, actually, uh, there is, it, I mean, it's similar to the question asked by Dr. Hassan. I mean, many times I have seen, uh, I've come across a scenario wherein uh, you are in a private hospital and uh, you have a patient coming in your emergency and then you feel the patient is quite sick but the patient is not affordable. And then you need to move that patient to a government facility. Uh, 
and it becomes a difficult scenario so i just wanted to ask that uh, how do you deal with your staff because it's a scenario where there's a lot of moral distress involved uh, in the whole team because the the whole team wants to help the patient in some way or the other but they know that they cannot because of the scenario involved so a sort of debriefing of the staff or or anything which uh, 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 praveen sir you have done in your practice see in our practice what we have done is uh, over time uh, you know i've been in practice for quite some time i have uh, kept contact with few of the key people at like all in institute of medical sciences sardarjang hospital these icu in charges uh, to be able to you know not always but whenever we are in that kind of financial distress uh, to be able to arrange the bed because these hospitals are always full you know so it is a good idea that people in private practice should have some of these contacts but in terms of the debriefing of the staff that we do they all understand this financial issue uh, when somebody cannot afford and if we are as a team able to find them a bed in the system that will take and that's a state uh, government system you know they they feel okay even though they like to do everything we tell them that, you know you save the life and now this patient needs to be transferred just purely because of financial reasons so during debriefing that uh, sort of tends to work uh, very well that you are able to reason it out uh, nicely uh, the other part of debriefing that happens when the survival is not there and when they try to do everything i think that's a totally separate issue where we discuss all the codes uh, after they have happened but at a separate time with with the whole staff and see how things could have been done differently right thank you sir yeah. thank you sir uh, uh dr nikhil i can conclude right yeah, sure sure please go ahead yeah please okay sir uh, um Dr. Joe, we the Mukura team, Hyderabad, India. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, so you you could find time for us. Thank you, thank you for the for the for the talk. Hello. I'm so glad. Yes, I was... thank you. Hello, sir. We thank you for your presence, sir, and uh, for your valuable time you gave us. And we are we are so thankful. And thank uh, you. Uh, nikhil we we will have this uh, recording in the on the youtube right youtube yes uh, because many of the people who are may yeah. have missed it yeah i will yeah. share it, yeah 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 and great great you get you guys all stay safe thank you all right stay Bye. safe and we're yeah. looking forward to when india play cricket in england because we're going to beat you again <laughs> yes <laughs> definitely <laughs> take care <Bye. laughs> all right